Okay, thanks a lot for coming. I'm Markus Korri. I'm uh, the national coordinator of Veritas Forum Finland. And uh, Veritas Forum is an organization that organizes academic events at the university campuses. Veritas Forum events are mainly organized, organized by students at the universities. These events are always focusing the biggest questions of life. The big questions might be meaning of life and, and the meaning of the universe. Is there any meanings? Happiness, self-identity, and so on. Veritas Forum is an independent organization, and we are working here in Finland in Finnish, in English, and in Swedish. Veritas Forum is basically these kind of events. These events are always an open plate for every kind of worldviews. Christian worldview is usually one part of use in the forums. Veritas Forum has organized high-level discussions if, uh, over 20 years, and uh, there have been many famous professors, politicians, and scientists in these forums world, worldwide. Well, even in the near future, in the late spring, we have pleased to have a very unique forum with Professor Trent Doherty from Baylor University and from Notre Dame University. He discussed uh, discusses uh, with Professor Sami Pilström uh, about the evidence of religious belief. Is there such an evidence? 26th May at Helsinki University. You are able to get the flyers from the back table over there, if you like. Veritas Forum have also released a few books about Veritas Forum teams. If you are interested about the books, you are welcome to buy those with C price on the back over there. Now I welcome a student of theology, theology uh, uh, faculty. Uh, she will uh, welcome uh, you from the theology student organization. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's nice to see that you're so many today. Um, so my name is Kata Kaski. So I'm, I'm a freshman here at the Faculty of Theology here in Helsinki, University of Helsinki. And I'm here today to welcome you all to today's forum on behalf of the Faculty Association for Theology Students. Um, so like you probably already saw on the screen, we are one of the organizations taking part in organizing these forums and events. And we are very proud to do so. And so we're very happy that, to see that these have been very successful in the last, or the last debates that we've seen have been um, very popular. And um, yeah, so I'm sure that the debate that we're going to witness is going to be really interesting and inspiring. And so I hope that you'll enjoy. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kata. And now we have uh, the Lennox is a Finnish publisher here from Uusitie uh, Kustannus Publishing House, yes. Hello, my name is Päivi Häkkinen and I represent uh, Uusitie Publishing House. Uh, I am happy to announce that we have here a freshly baked a new book from John Lennox in Finnish. And it is uh, 25 euros today. It is uh, 32 euros normally, but today 25 euros. So, <laughs> carpe diem. <laughs> Uh, I also uh, ask you, Mr. Lennox, to come here. Is it possible? <laughs> I have something for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello. 
nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, welcome to Finland. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought that uh, I want to buy you some present to remember us. <laughs> and I also thought that uh, what to buy so that you really would remember us. <laughs> so in the back here, which I now give you. Thank you very much. And I thought that uh, because you uh, are sitting in the planes and in libraries and you are reading and writing a lot in your job, so you need this kind of thing. It's a <laughs> which kipu is, kuku. Yes, which is called fin hook. Oh, thank so you So when very you much. feel some pain in your back or shoulders, this will help you, I promise. Wonderful. <laughs> Oh. There is also some finished chocolate to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> we are here to you. Okay, now we have an uh, opportunity to welcome our moderator, um, <laughs> Professor Markus Lammenranta. And uh, also our uh, panelists, uh, John Lennox, and uh, Matti Kampinen, please come here. Welcome to this debate or friendly discussion about the relation between science and religion. I am Markus Lammerant. I am acting professor in theoretical philosophy at the University of Helsinki, and I will be the moderator. Uh, one of the two speakers, Professor Lennox, is a professor in mathematics at the University of Oxford and fellow in mathematics and philosophy of science at Green Temple College. He has published several books about science, faith, theology, and debated several times, for example, with Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. You can find videos of those debates in YouTube, if you like. The other speaker, Professor Kampinen, Matti Kampinen is a professor in comparative literature at the University of Turku. He has published widely, not just on religious studies, but also on philosophy and cognitive science. The discussion is based on Professor Lennox's books, God, God's Undertaker, Has Science Buried God? The book is a contribution to a currently very hot topic about the relation of science and religion. Many people think that there's a serious conflict between science and religion. Uh, many scientists and philosophers think so, but so do many Christians. If that is true, it seems that one of them must go we must either reject science as fundamentalist Christians do, or we must reject religion as the so-called new atheist, Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, and Christopher Hutchins insist. I think one important message of the book is that no such choice is necessary because there is no real conflict between science and religion, especially theistic religions, such as Christianity. Indeed, science supports theism rather than atheism. So one central question for the debate or discussion is, uh, <coughs> what does science really support? theism, atheism, or perhaps 
agnosticism. To put it more generally, whether God exists must be determined by evidence. So we just follow the evidence. And this is another important point in the book. And it's a good starting point for rational dialogue. So when we start the discussion, Professor Lennox will start, and then Professor Kampinen will give him his comments. And after that, we will continue the discussion. And finally, we will take some audience questions. But please put your questions on paper. You can find those papers there, and we collect them later. And, and keep the questions to the topic, so that, and, and rather short, so it's, you have a better chance mm -hmm. to be answered. And so, please, Professor Nox. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your welcome to Helsinki. I have never been here before, and I owe you a deep apology. Here you are, all being prepared to listen to my English. And unfortunately, on Fridays, my Finnish disappears. <laughs> So thank you for your patience. I'm greatly honored to have my colleague, Professor Kampinen from Turku as a discussion partner on this topic. And as we look at it, your chairman has just led us to the very heart of it. It is absolutely clear, I think, that the conflict does not lie between science and belief in God. If you think of the Nobel Prize for Physics, it was won last year by Peter Higgs. He is an atheist. A few years ago, it was won by William Phillips, who is a Christian. What divides them is not their science. What divides them is their worldview. One is a theist, a Christian, the other is an atheist. And I'm going to suggest that the real question that faces us in this debate is which way does science point? Now, in my book, I interpret science in the narrow British sense of the natural sciences. But today, we're going to think of science in the sense of Wissenschaft, that is knowledge, argument. Because many people think that the only rationally intelligent position to hold is that of atheist. I believe that to be false. And the question to be addressed is, where does science point, if anywhere? Does it point towards theism, atheism, agnosticism, or is it completely neutral? Now, history tells us something. It tells us that modern science rose in the 16th and 17th centuries in an atmosphere of belief in God. And the general consensus among philosophers and historians of science is this. I quote C.S. Lewis here. Men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. In other words, faith in God, far from hindering the rise of science, was the very motor that drove it. And I'm not remotely ashamed of being a scientist and a Christian because arguably Christianity gave me my subject. The idea that there's a rational intelligence behind the universe was a very fruitful one because it moved people like Galileo and Kepler and Newton and Clark Maxwell and Babbage to study the universe believing that science could be done. And that, I believe, we owe to the Judeo-Christian tradition. But that's a very odd situation because Newton believed in God and Stephen Hawking doesn't. Stephen Hawking, the latest holder of Newton's chair at Cambridge. And it raises a question for many modern people. What has happened between the 17th century and the 21st century? And I want to submit to you that what has happened is a great deal of confusion, firstly, about the nature of God, and secondly, about the nature of science. Because there are certain gods that science does bury. And one of them is the so-called God of the gaps. 
You see, when I speak about God, ladies and gentlemen, let me be clear that I mean the God of the three great monotheistic religions, the God of the Bible. That is the God who is the eternal creator of the heavens and the earth and who upholds it. He's not like an ancient Greek god. The great god of thunder invented by human beings to explain thunder will disappear when you do atmospheric physics at the University of Helsingfors very rapidly. And many people therefore think that the god I believe in, for instance, is a kind of god of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. Now listen very carefully to this. If you define God as a God of the gaps, of course you have to choose between God and science because that is the way you define God. Let's be very clear that when at least I am talking about God, I mean the God who's the creator of everything, not simply the things we don't understand, but the things we do. And that's why Isaac Newton, when he discovered his law of gravity, didn't say, I've got a law of gravity, therefore I don't need God. No. What he did do was to write the Principia Mathematica expressing in it the wish that the thinking person on reading it would come to believe in a deity. For Newton, the more he understood of how the creation works, the more he admired the genius of the God that did it that way. And that is precisely the view I take. I do not believe in a God of the gaps. And it's just like that with art or anything else. The more you understand of art, the more you can admire the genius of a Rembrandt. The more you understand of engineering, the more you can understand the genius of a Rolls Royce and so on. So it's very important that we realize that what we are talking about is not the God of the gaps. The second reason why many people have given up on God is they do not understand the nature of scientific explanation. Science explains, but what do we mean by that? We got a law of gravity, but the law of gravity does not tell you what gravity is. Nobody knows what gravity is. The law of gravity enables you to make sophisticated calculations that will land someone on the moon. It doesn't tell you what gravity is. And having a law and a mechanism is not an argument against the existence of an agent who set up that law or designed that mechanism. And it seems to me many people like Richard Dawkins, my colleague, a colleague at Oxford, are arguing like this. Because I understand the law of internal combustion and a little bit of automobile engineering, I refuse to believe in Henry Ford. That is absurd. It is a confusion of philosophical category. Explanation in terms of law and mechanism, the natural sciences, explanation in terms of agency and intention is a very different kind of explanation. And any school child realizes that you need both levels of explanation to give a full explanation. Now, at this point, and this is an objection that Richard Dawkins has made very popular throughout the world, though people don't always quote him when they use it, that if you bring God into the equation anywhere, this is foolish, because God by definition is more complex than the thing you're explaining, and therefore he is not an explanation. Related to that is the idea that if you think that God created the universe, then you'll have to ask who created God. And so on ad absurdum, therefore there isn't a God. Now I hold both of those arguments to be seriously flawed. Let's take the second one first. Who created God? That is what many philosophers call a complex question. It hides an assumption. The assumption is that God was created. Who created X assumes X was created. So it bypasses anything that isn't created. And certainly the Christian claim from where I stand is that God wasn't created so that the question doesn't even apply to him. So far from it demolishing God, it doesn't even apply. It does, of course, apply to created gods. But you will notice that Dawkins' book was not called The Created God's Delusion. Otherwise, nobody would have bought it. Because created gods are obviously a delusion, aren't they? And when I debated him on the topic, I pointed out to him that this question can be reversed. 
And I said, Richard, you believe the universe created you. Okay, let me ask you your question. Who created your creator? I've waited seven years for the answer and I haven't got it yet. So that question, but now what about this matter of complexity? Well, it's wonderful in science, and I love it, when we can get an explanation that moves from the simple to the, uh, to the complex. But you can't always get that, ladies and gentlemen. You see, this notion that an explanation must be always simpler than what we're explaining, we have to be very careful with, for a very obvious reason. Uh, let me use Dawkins as an example, but anything will do. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. It's quite complex. It's about 400 pages. So if I ask about its origin and say, well, it originated in the infinitely more complex mind of Richard Dawkins, well, then that's not an explanation because the explanation is more complex than the thing you're explaining. <coughs> that's sheer nonsense. And in forensic science, we may have a simple murder. The explanation would be the complex intentions and thoughts of the perpetrator. In archaeology, we might see just simple scratches on a stone, but we infer from their structure that what lies behind them is an infinitely more complex mind. And what I'm suggesting to you, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Reductionist explanations, everything reducible to physics and chemistry, work in many areas. But they do not work where you have a semiotic, a symbolic, a linguistic dimension. The moment we see anything at the level of ordinary language, computer language, genetic language, uh, computer languages and programs, we infer an intelligence. It's interesting that, isn't it? Instantly we infer intelligence. You only have to see the letters of your name well, in Finnish, it's probably 27 letters. In English, it might be four. Um, uh, written on a beach, and you say intelligence. Now, that's a very important thing. You do not regard that as a non-explanation. So this idea that God is an explanation is ruled out because he's more complex than the thing you're explaining would rule out humanity as an explanation for anything. Because if I write a book, it's less complex than me. But I'm the ultimate explanation for it. So we need to be aware of that. And there's a lot to be thought about it. Um, it is an argument that is very commonly used. Now, related to that, you see, is the fact that mathematics, my own subject, is marvelously effective in understanding the universe. And Einstein was amazed at this. And Eugen Wigner, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, wrote a book, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics. How does it work? Now, here we're in front of a very interesting phenomenon. You see, as a scientist, I believe that science can be done. We have a caricature of an idea of the world today that faith is a religious word, and it means believing where there is no evidence. I think that is dangerously false in two senses. Faith, certainly in the Christian sense, is belief, commitment based on evidence. And faith, coming from Latin fides, trust, is part and parcel of all science and philosophy. You cannot do any science or philosophy without believing something. Now, as a scientist, I have to believe that the universe is rationally intelligible. Why should I believe that? So let me cut the argument to make it as simple as possible. What do I do science with? I do it with my mind. In the reductionist view, my mind is my brain, full stop. What is my brain? My brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. Oh, really? If you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you trust it? Well, of course you wouldn't, not for a moment. And incidentally, this is an idea that Charles Darwin came up with. He was very concerned at the fact that the human mind, which he believed um, was descended from much simpler minds, how would you possibly trust it when it told you anything at all. And this argument has been used 
This argument against extreme reductionism has been used by many people. Let me give the example of one of America's leading philosophers, two of them, one an atheist, one a Christian. Take the Christian first, Alvin Plantinga. If Dawkins is right, that we are the product of mindless, unguided natural processes, then he has given us strong reason to doubt the reliability of human cognitive faculties, and therefore inevitably to doubt the validity of any belief that they produce, including Dawkins' own science and his atheism. His biology, now this is very interesting, his biology and his belief in naturalism would therefore appear to be at war with each other in a conflict that has nothing at all to do with God. More recently, cyberspace has been seriously um, <clears throat> interrupted by an atheist philosopher, Thomas Nagel, in his book, Mind and Cosmos. He writes this, if the mental is not itself merely physical, it cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturalism itself depends. The irony of the discussion, ladies and gentlemen, is that my chief objection to atheism, and one of the major reasons I believe in God, has nothing to do with my Christian faith. It's to do with the fact that I'm a scientist. Because atheism cuts the ground of the faith, the rational justification for the faith that I need to do my science. I would suggest to you that atheism not simply, it doesn't simply shoot itself in the foot, it shoots itself in the brain. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. From my behalf also, it is a pleasure and honor to be here to share thoughts with uh, Professor John Lennox and, and uh, discuss these deep issues with a learned audience as we have here today. Yes, uh, I'm an anthropologist of religion and a philosopher of science. And uh, I took the liberty of putting the title of, in plural, as science buried gods. First, think. Think. Well, my answer is, well, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, the anthropomorphic explanations provided by religions their major cognitive content, have been largely replaced by scientific explanations. I think that's an empirical fact. And second, um, there are no successful research paradigms where gods are postulated as strategic, causally relevant factors. Science is an atheist enterprise, and as far as we know, there are no gods in the furniture of the world. As John Lennox points out in his interesting and well-argumented, well-argued book, many scientists have been motivated by their belief in, in creator God. And Christianity has had, had, had an, uh, a major impact in forming science. And uh, uh, it is also an empirical fact that many scientists are motivated by personal greed. But it doesn't mean that, that science is about personal greed or, or, or search for fame. Motivation, the psychological motivation, and the justification are two different things. I do agree that the idea of a, of a consistent lawgiver, a god who loves mathematics, is a, is a kind of a good motivation when you are searching for order. But I think those times have passed now. If you look at Isaac Newton's book on theology, 
which he wrote, or the last chapter in, in, in his Principia uh, work. Uh, you can see that those are not at the level of, of his mathematical treatises or physical treatises. Well, this is a general, uh, general uh, and uh, yes, the, the third point was that the technology provides a pragmatic justification for the scientific outlook. Uh, I think many of you have something like this with you. Well, take a look at it and think, why does it work? What kind of a universe it, presupp it presupposes? How is the world is constructed in order for that to work? Well, this sometimes does not work, but this is Nokia Lumia, but otherwise. <laughs> well, then some specific issues in, in John Lennox's book, God's Undertaker, has science buried God? Well, uh, the first point I'd, I'd like to uh, point out the diversity of religions and gods. Uh, we, in comparative religion, we think gods are culturally postulated superhuman agents. And uh, there are religions, for example, Christianity, where the theological product development or theological sophistication gives you whatever you want. Talented people uh, built up uh, gods with different uh, properties and, 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 and you, you end up with different kinds of creatures. And another other thing I'd like to then uh, point out the, uh, about this book is the, the anthropomorphic fallacy, as I call it. Uh, John Lennox uh, deals with several intelligent design arguments, uh, and his favorite example concerns Aunt Matilda's cake and a Ford engine, and we come to that later on. But first of all, about the diversity the cultural diversity of gods. I have studied folk religion and shamanism in, in Peruvian Amazon. It looks like that. It's warmer than in Helsinki. And uh, people are quite uh, poor there and, and not so well off. They suffer from different kinds of illnesses. Uh, some illnesses are, are what we call uh, real and some illnesses are, are imaginary. And for example, here a shaman is treating a a young patient who suffers from fright, from susto in Spanish. And uh, he's uh, blowing tobacco smoke on the top of his head in order to get rid of the, rid of the uh, evil spirits. What causes fright is a forest spirit. And that's the local god. I mean, a culturally postulated superhuman agent, which can cause fright. And uh, it is cured by, by, uh, by shamans. And these kinds of gods uh, are uh, kind of a easier cases. They can be even photographed. It's in the uh, upper right corner on the, on, the, on the tree there, hanging in there. I got this picture from Amazon. They told me that they have a, even a photograph of, the, of this, of this uh, god. Well, uh, give, hand these gods over to uh, uh, theologically educated, intelligent, talented people of the Western world and the uh, uh, great religions, you get theological uh, product development. Uh, and uh, what you get in the course of uh, history of religions is that as, as uh, the professionals of, of religions uh, uh, construct uh, concepts and theories about gods, uh, you get almost anything out of it. That's why I have called it, you name it, we have it, department. For example, uh, if uh, the god figure is too, resembles too much human beings, then, then we abstract it. If it's, uh, uh, if it's uh, suspected that it does not participate in the causal processes of, of this world, then we situate in, in outside the world as the ground of all being, as some of my colleagues in theology call their God. So that it is uh, the result of a theological product development. And uh, this theological uh, sophistication or product development, it has different results in different religions. John Polkinghorn, who is, uh, uh, shares some of the ideas uh, with, with John Lennox, he was your teacher, I, I assume. Uh, he, for example, uh, 
characterizes uh, Trinity as a as an uh, as a structure of the world that that makes it understandable why why uh, uh, why the theory of, of of relativity holds true. So in the Trinity, things are relative to each other, and that's why the theory, the general theory of, of relativity, holds true. I don't know if I if I read all the all the details right, but that's I think a good example of theological product development. You transform the God into such a uh, uh, such a uh, shape that it's it's almost it's almost difficult to 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 recognize anything about it. Then there are examples from from Islam and from uh, from uh, from Buddhism, but let's not go into details in those details. What is interesting, uh, and this comes out in John Lennox's book, is that at the same time with the theological sophistication, gods are still equipped with anthropomorphic qualities, and and uh, so that they they have all kinds of non-human qualities. But in addition, they are all loving, benevolent creatures, especially in, in Christianity. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this combination of, of uh, properties brings about the classical paradoxes of, of, uh, in the philosophy of, of, of religion. That, that how, for example, a creator who is omniscient, omnipotent and benevolent, how he or she can tolerate what happens in the world and all, or let it all happen. Well, that has that has given job to many many theologians and, and, and philosophers. That's for true. But but uh, the anthropomorphic fallacy uh, is uh, still strongly uh, uh, with us. And uh, what I mean by anthropomorphic fallacy is that is that we impute uh, uh, human-like qualities to uh, to the uh, non-human reality. That, for example, where we see apparent design or clever solutions in the nature, we, we uh, assume that it has been uh, designed by an intelligent uh, being. That's the uh, anthropomorphic fallacy, which is deeply rooted in us for several uh, phylogenetic and ontogenetic reasons. And this shows the... the, the, the the man on Mars, the, the face figure uh, pictured by Viking uh, uh, thing, <laughs> explorer, many many years ago, and and, and uh, it was thought that yes, this is the this is the uh, this is the man on the, on on Mars. I have an example, a short example of of anthropomorphic uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, Fallacy and and, uh, and how it is used uh, in uh, in the in the Peruvian Amazon, from where my, some of my examples come, they think that the pink river dolphin, which is pictured here, which is a real animal, it can cause uh, stomach pain, and uh, uh, if especially if you if you walk in a in a in a muddy river bank there, but what is uh, Better explanation is that the hookworms, which is kind of a parasitic thing, it uh, enters your body and, and causes all these all these uh, uh, all these symptoms. In both cases, the anthropomorphic pink river dolphin explanation and the hookworm explanation, we get a, a, a structure like this: that the observed phenomena are explained by by postulated explanatory mechanism, and the anthropomorphic fallacy uh, amounts to the case where we postulate human-like features or properties uh, and mechanisms in the world where there are none. We seek meaning, uh, we, uh, we uh, look uh, eagerly for, for meaningfulness, for human relevance, and we think that these clever solutions or things that we encounter in this world are designed by, by intelligent intelligent uh, designers. Well, the two examples uh, to haste towards the end uh, discussed by John Lennox in his books. The first is Aunt Matilda's cake. I don't know whether it looks like this, but, but, uh, but John, John Lennox's point is that, that, uh, that the, the, the scientist's story 
cannot give a uh, give a, a, a total account of, of the of the meanings of this cake. That the, if we pull up physicists and 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 and, and chemists and and other other biologists, for example, their story will not empty all the meanings of Aunt Matilda's cake. That we need the Aunt Matilda's perspective and her story of why this cake was made. Well, I would add that, that, that if we send in an anthropologist or, or an ethnographer or sociologist, then we could get even more fuller, fuller uh, account of what is the meaning of this cake, how it was received by those who had a bite of it and, and how it was perceived. Was it a, was it a ritual? Was it, a, was it a gift? Was it a normal cake? Was it an extravagant cake or what, whatever? So if we pull up more scientists in the sense of including ethnographers and others, we would get even more better, better uh, view of, of, the, of the meanings of this, of this uh, cake. So we don't actually, we would get even better view than by exploring Aunt Matilda's own view. Then the second example uh, discussed by John Lennox is the Ford engine. This is, I think, model Duratec, one point something. Well, the Ford people will know. So uh, uh, John Lennox's point is that, is that, um, is that, uh, this uh, uh, should be ultimately explained by uh, the intentions of, of Ford engineers, or even by the intention of, of Mr. Ford, who, who put up, who built the company. But uh, my uh, point is that that we cannot compare uh, man-made design with the machinery of nature. So that uh, uh, the machinery we encounter in nature, it is clever, and it appears to be, be clever, uh, but it is molded or produced by mechanistic forces of, of natural selection. I think there's a, with all due respect, I think the comparison is false. We cannot do that because we know that these Ford engines are engineered by, by people, with, by intelligent actors, but uh, the machinery of nature is not engin engineered by the major engineer. And uh, we can even provide ultimate explanation of these Ford engines. We can ask that how on earth there are uh, actors equipped with engineering skills we can provide evolutionary account of how there came to be people in the first place, how their skills were perfected uh, during, the, during the thousands of years, and how, how then finally they, uh, they, they built skills with which they could uh, produce these Ford engines. I think that when we are looking for ultimate explanation, then we end up uh, with uh, very simple mechanisms, how our ancestors were selected for uh, in, in, the, in the early past. And I think uh, this is also the case when, when you, you compared, uh, you said that, that explaining your book by referring to your mind, which is much more complex, would not be possible in that, in that construct, but, but the, then we could give a an evolutionary account that how actors like you uh, came to this world in the first place, and how these those cognitive skills demanded for required for for writing books on these topics, how they were possible, so that the ultimate explanation I think would uh, we would then uh, uh, use uh, uh, the simple evolutionary accounts. Well, not that simple, but anyway, mechanistic. Uh, if you want to call them blind uh, evolutionary mechanisms to, to explain that. So uh, I think the examples used in John Lennox's books, books uh, and this book are, are, are very educating, but, uh, but in most of them I then would add that where's the evolution of humanity then, and evolutionary 
evolutionary accounts just fit in, fit in those, those places perfectly. And finally, uh, the anthropic puzzle that why are we here? How come that this physical universe uh, is so finely tuned that we can exist here, that, that it was possible for biological life to, to emerge and, and, and finally uh, for human beings come into being. Well, the short answer is that, that the, our ancestors and their very, very ancestors of, of much simpler kind, they adapted to physical conditions. And uh, it can be seen in a, in a biology textbooks, if you remember from, from uh, your biology textbooks from, from high school, uh, that, uh, for example, the case of pepper moth, moth uh, uh, which uh, uh, turned, due to the blackening of trees, due to the, uh, due to the uh, 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 smoke from, from, from industry, the, the tree bark turned turned uh, darker and blacker, so the pepper moth developed a version of itself which suited better into that environment. And now imagine a pepper moth asking a question, how come I fit here so perfectly? Did the grand designer design this dark tree bark for me in order to flourish here better than the paler cousin? on the left there. And I think uh, uh, if we are putting this, if we are pre take, presenting the same question to, to, uh, to us as, as humans, I think it has a, a same, same logic. We are here because we are here. Because we adapted in a very long time, long time span, our ancestors have been, have adapted to, to physical conditions. And the last picture, which is a place where I like to be, that's my summer cottage, our summer cottage porch in archipelago of Finland, near Turku. It's a place where I do enjoy spending summer times. So uh, there uh, I <coughs> asked the question that how, how come I fit here so, so perfectly? And, and, and look around and see the, see the rocks and the trees and the, and the sea and, uh, and, and rejoice in the, in, the, in the feeling and the understanding that, that the very slow evolutionary forces once formed these environments to be like this. And I just then happened to be there and enjoy the scenery. So uh, I think it would be What's the word in English? Uh, preposterous to think that this, was, that this was specifically engineered for me and for, for my pleasure. And to end, as ending in, uh, in ending all the lectures for more reading, Dawkins underestimated in many, many courts and uh, Mario Bunger, philosopher of science, what uh, scientific explanations are like. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It is delightful to discuss with someone who's actually read my book. <laughs> But not surprisingly, ladies and gentlemen, I disagree. <laughs> Number one, the point made that no successful research paradigms where gods are postulated. I agree if you keep gods with a small g, that's correct. But my first argument was the whole of modern science is based on a research paradigm launched by belief in the God who is creator and upholder of the universe. And I think that one of the difficulties with your argument, sir, is the failure to distinguish between the gods of the ancient Near East, 
which are anthropomorphic creations, and I share your view of them, and the God of creation, who is not an anthropomorphic God. It's actually the other way round. Now, you talked about the anthropomorphic fallacy, and I think there are many anthropomorphic fallacies. But behind all of this lies a profound question. If there is a God who created the heavens and the earth and you, then it is arguable that you and I are made in his image. That's not an anthropomorphism. That's not an anthropomorphism. That is the claim that we are made in God's image. Now, I would want to argue that many of the gods, all of them in the ancient Near East, were made in our image. But if you're going to argue that everything, including a belief in the God who's a creator, is culturally produced, then okay, but atheism is therefore culturally produced and is exactly the same value as the other belief systems. And therefore, because I'm a scientist, I'm interested in where the evidence points. And it's very interesting to me the way you ended your argument in talking about ultimate reality, because I think that brings us to the real issue. The question is not, is there an ultimate reality? The question is, which reality is ultimate? And what I believe my friend is claiming is that uh, the ultimate reality is blind mechanistic processes, in other words, mass energy. And therefore, everything else, including intelligence and the idea of God, is explicable bottom up. I believe the exact opposite, that the ultimate reality is intelligent God. And that, as I say, provided the launch pad for science. My colleague suggests that Christianity, and I'm glad he agrees, was a very good motivation for the rise of science, and those times have passed, but that's an assertion. I do not believe those times have passed. And, and secondly, what is replacing them? Science, you say, is an atheistic enterprise. So you're equating science with atheism. But science is a set of intellectual disciplines for analyzing nature. Atheism is a worldview. Now, you see, I could equally well say science is, but I wouldn't say it, is a theistic enterprise. Because when you're studying how nature works, it makes very little difference whether you believe it's actually designed or apparently designed. The interesting thing is that even atheist scientists use theistic presuppositions when they're doing their science. What's this for? This looks as if it's designed to do that, and so on. So it seems to me that uh, the argument doesn't work there. Now, I, I liked your analysis of Aunt Matilda and the cake. That was a nice cake that you gave to us. But I think you missed the point, or at least several of the points. Uh, you said, well, I mentioned physicists and chemists in my book. That's because the science in my book is natural science. If I'd been writing the book more generally, I would have very happily introduced an anthropologist. I could even have introduced you. But you see, I still think the argument stands. If Aunt Matilda has made that cake for a purpose, even the anthropologist will not know why she did it unless she speaks. The point of the analogy is, if something is made by an intelligent mind, there comes a point where no amount of external analysis will tell you why it was done unless the person speaks. You can put me under a tunneling scanning microscope. You can subject me to physics, chemistry, anthropology, and every intellectual discipline you like. But if I don't speak, you will have no idea what I'm thinking. That's the point I'm making. And it was a simple analogy, which I believe works very well. And it raises the question about the universe. It was really an analogy raising a question. Is there someone who sits in the same relationship to the universe as Aunt Matilda? Now, the Ford engine analogy, ultimately explained by engineers, we cannot compare man-made design with machinery of nature. Why on earth not? The, thing, the fact is that our research in genetics, our research in cell biology is constantly and increasingly using words from disciplines like theoretical computer science. 
because the things we find in nature are machines every bit as much as the kind of machines that we ourselves invent. Uh, computers are information processors. They're nowhere near as sophisticated as the information processing capacity of a cell. Now you say w that um, these machines have been produced by nature. That is an assertion. And furthermore, you uh, said that they are explained by evolution. The existence of life, ladies and gentlemen, even Dawkins admits, is not explained by evolution. Because whatever evolution does, you have to have life in order to get it going. You cannot use a mutating replicator as an explanation for its own existence. And to put the word evolution across the origin of life, the origin of the information processing capacity of the cells is, I would want to suggest, even worse than the god of the gaps. It's an evolution of the gaps. And many leading scientists are rebelling against it. Robert Lachlan won the Nobel Prize for Origin of Life Science and he said, I'm fed up with ev evolution being used as a placeholder and an anti-theory. And he gives an example. Your mess of proteins became a chicken. Evolution did it. He says, this is holding science back. And I'm touched by my colleague's faith in the power of the mechanism that explains industrial melanism. And by the way, those photographs that were taken of moss, if they're the same ones that I know about, the moss were pinned on the trees. And there's been a huge bit of academic research. And of course, th that proves nothing. It's only a site variation in species, it doesn't explain the existence of the moths in the first place. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I am very concerned about explanations in terms of blind, unguided forces. Now, I'm not a biologist, and nor is my colleague, maybe he is, but I read a lot of biology, and what I'm very intrigued by is the recent um, increase in the number of leading biologists who are demoting the power of natural selection almost to zero. One of the leading American, uh, William Provine, who was Dawkins' opposite number for many years, has just rewritten the foreword to a standard text. And he's well known in the States. He says, and I'm quoting approximately, natural selection does nothing, creates nothing, moves nothing. And he points out that people that believe in a creator have found our massive weak point. Watch this space. I am not at all convinced as you will see, as a scientist, that natural processes are responsible for the existence of anything that involves language like DNA and so on. So you could put it down to evolution. That doesn't make any sense to me as an explanation. And in the end, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to decide on the basis of the evidence. And I would prefer an explanation that made sense in terms of an intelligent God than one that actually doesn't even allow me to trust my intelligence. I don't think that science is an atheist enterprise. When you analyze it in the way I did formally, you're really saying at the heart of science lies blind faith. Blind faith that an unguided principle has produced the minds that do the science. Why on earth should we trust it? I didn't hear any argument against that, so I better stop now okay. and let my colleague say something. Okay. Thank you. Okay, peace. I've okay, got point number 33. Where, where to begin? Well, uh, 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 you are... Uh, uh, well, let's start with Aunt Matilda's cake. Uh, the, the strategy is... is, is well adapted uh, when, when we are studying humans. We ask people why they do the things they do, and we get answers, and we get, we get uh, let's say, common sense psychological explanations for, for what people are doing. I think that strategy works with Aunt Matilda's cake, but it does not work uh, with a, with a uh, non-human universe, because uh, then we must uh, assume that there is a that there is an uh, actor who is who is preparing these uh, things uh, and, and and constructing constructing the the uh, universe. Uh, and then from the start, the next point was that uh, that uh, the 
belief in Christian God has motivated many scientists, and I, I agree that that's the case. But uh, uh, as I said, it, it, is, uh, it is not the case that, that, it, it, that, uh, that it would uh, provide a justification for, for, uh, for uh, uh, let's say, uh, for any scientific, uh, sorry, for any, okay, for any uh, scientific uh, results. So that, uh, I think that uh, distinguishing between motivation and, 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 and justification is an, is an important thing. I, it is an empirical fact that, that uh, uh, many scientists are motivated by personal greed and search for personal glory. But it does not follow that science is about uh, greed and, and, and glory. No. And, and so our, mo our motivations can be quite, quite many. And what I'm claiming specifically when I, when I said that, uh, that uh, science is an atheist enterprise is that as far as I know, there are no uh, scientific frameworks or research frameworks actually where, where research is actually carried out where God is in a, in a, uh, in a position of causally relevant strategic actor. But would you expect it to be? You see, uh, uh, let me try and explain this a bit, a bit more clearly. Um, you could study um, automobiles or computers and you'll never find Henry Ford in any of the research programs. But the fact that you've got something to study is traceable back to Henry Ford. It's the same with the jet engine. Many people in universities study uh, the, uh, the theory of uh, turbo combustion engines and jet engines and all this kind of thing. And uh, let me put it this way. In philosophical terms, we're talking at the meta level. In other words, what I'm claiming is there wouldn't be a universe to study if God hadn't created it. The physicists didn't create it, nor did the scientists. God created it. And the point is, I, I don't think the situation is like motivation, like greed. Of course, scientists can be greedy and all this kind of stuff. The point is that the belief that there is a rational creator formed the substance that led to the conviction that science could be done. Now, all I'm saying is this, Einstein himself put it this way, I cannot imagine a scientist without that faith. Not faith in God, of course, but faith in the rational intelligibility of the universe. Yep. And what I'm claiming, just, just to finish, uh, Matty, briefly, is what I'm claiming is atheism removes the rational justification for that, where theism holds it firmly in place. That's all I'm saying. And therefore, the one makes sense to me and the other doesn't. So yeah. how would you react to that? Yeah, I do agree that uh, the that, uh, scientific enterprise is, is based on, on, on various philosophical assumptions concerning, for example, the, the lawfulness yes. of the universe. But, that, but it does not follow from that that there is a creator god of Christianity who is producing that Lawfulness but because, doesn't uh, follow in what sense? Do you mean in the sheer logical sense or in the fact, as I would say, uh, th that it's a very good pointer in that direction? It certainly doesn't point in the opposite direction. Uh, well, uh, it's, it certainly points to the, to the direction that, that, uh, that the assumption of, of, of lawfulness and, uh, and, and of uh, lawfully behaving, behaving material concrete systems uh, is an assumption that that pays off in science, but it has nothing nothing to do with a, with a creator God. I mean, material. Well, it's that's a, a statement. Uh, sir, no, no, that's no. a statement for which you're not giving me any rational justification. That original assumption in science had everything to do with belief in a creator, and it still can. People may reject it, but historically, that's the case. But I think the moderator wants to say okay. something. Okay, perhaps I can <laughs> come between and. Uh, say a few words about evidence and also that there might be a middle ground between you, your positions. Uh, as an epistemologist, I am inclined to say that Professor Lennox gives some nice arguments for theism or existence of God. Uh, 
based on natural science. But of course, it is, it is not easy to evaluate the strength of this, this evidence, but it may not be enough to justify us believing in God because there might be other evidence, not based on natural science, but perhaps on social sciences or history. For example, some facts may be easier to explain if you're an atheist. For example, biblical research suggests that the Bible is unreliable, and there's also this classical question of evil and suffering in the world. And uh, it is, this fact makes it rather improbable that the world is governed and created by perfectly good and all-powerful God. And, and third, third question is this plurality of religions. So it might be easy to easier explain naturalistically than if you are theist. So that, these are just, just uh, to point out that um, we, we should take all evidence into account when we try to decide what we should believe. And, and of course, you might have different views or, or evaluate very differently all this evidence. And that's why, of course, there are all these disagreements. But anyway, if you want to comment about this, so oh, it's, yes, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course I do. And I take your point, sir. I take your point. I never claimed that all my reasons for theism came from science. I was invited to do a forum on has science buried God? I don't think it has. But if you ask now this different question, which is, what about evidence? And I'm glad you raised the question of evidence, because I'm a pure mathematician. And proof, in the rigorous sense, you only get in my field. You don't even get it in the natural sciences. Proof, in the sense of a set of axioms, a given logic reaching a firm conclusion, is unique to mathematics. But in the informal sense of evidence that is proof beyond reasonable doubt, and so on. I can't prove to you that my wife loves me, but I've had 46 years of marriage and I'd stake my life on it. You see, that point is, is very important to me. So when it comes to the big questions, like the question of suffering and evil that, that you introduced, uh, Matty, and the moderator has now introduced, science will not answer that question for me in the narrow sense. I do believe Christianity does give me a way into an answer that makes sense. Now, I can certainly comment on that if you wish me to in the audience later, because it is the hardest question I face. I do not think atheism solves it either, actually. And I, I don't actually agree that the atheistic answer is any better, because, of course, atheism, which says the universe is just like it is, by definition, because it believes death is the end, removes all hope. It doesn't remove the suffering. The suffering's still there. Christianity, because it believes in the resurrection of Christ and uh, uh, believes in a God who's taken part in our human suffering, gives me a tremendous uh, way of responding, I believe, to our deepest problem of suffering. That's a little bit away from our topic, but I'm perfectly prepared to address it. As for the plurality of religions, we need to be careful there because it seems to me there are two kinds of plurality. You'll find there's not so much a plurality of moralities, that most religions have a common core of morality. The uh, matter of the golden rule will be found in every religion, non-religion, philosophy you, are there, you will read about. And the reason for that, of course, from where I sit, is that we are made in the image of God as moral beings. So not surprisingly, whether we believe in God or not, we'll come up with very similar moralities. The differences occur when, between religions when it comes to the much more historic uh, events. Uh, for instance, just to make this clear, my Muslim friends, and I have many of them, believe that Jesus did not die. My Jewish friends, and I have a lot of those as well, believed that uh, he died but didn't rise. I believe he both died and rose. 
Now, all those three things cannot be simultaneously true. And that brings me, therefore, back to your question of evidence. The only way I know how to decide things like that is by investigating evidence. But it's not inductive scientific evidence. It's the evidence, A, of history and B, of personal experience. That's broadening the topic, which I'm very happy okay. to do. Okay. So uh, we soon will gather questions from the audience. But first, Martin, uh, yes, you can start. a short note on, uh, on the plurality of, of religions. Uh, in your book, you, you argue that, that uh, Christianity stands apart in terms that, that the creator God kind of creates the world out of nothing. So that the cosmo cosmogonic myth of, of Christianity says that, that uh, God created the, the, the world uh, by saying that, 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 uh, that let there well, be... Well, Judaism and Islam agree with yeah, that. Yeah. But, uh, but how about other older religions which have exactly the same uh, myth about the, the origins of the world? For example, Egyptian or, or, uh, or some Polynesian myths. I mean, the, 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 what, what, what may, isn't it hard to, to, uh, to, uh, to argue for the position that, that, that uh, in the course of history of different religions, this quite recent newcomer Christianity would be kind of a specific well, thing. Well, my reaction is, you see, the assumptions in your statement, the cosmogenic myth of Christianity, well, that's an assumption. I don't believe it's a myth at all. And secondly, the interesting thing about it is that for centuries the Bible has been saying that there was a beginning. It took the scientists until the 20th century, in the middle of it, to catch up with what the Bible has been saying. And... Uh, you, let me make a little comment on what you earlier said. You said there are no scientific programs based on belief in God. Well, I suggested to the people at CERN, with whom I had a discussion not long ago, that if they'd taken the Bible a little bit more seriously than Aristotle, they might have looked for evidence for a beginning far earlier than they did. That's but they uh, didn't. I'm, I'm sorry to... Okay. But, 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 you know, it's, it's, let, let me finish on this. There are many religions, I'm aware of that, and so are you, and you study them and know more about them than I do. But in my limited world, I have to decide on the basis of evidence. And I've read as much as I can about other religions, and I've come to my decisions, as you must, on the basis of evidence. And the whole point of having a forum like this is to give you different perspectives to help in that making up your mind process. Okay. Okay, we appreciate very much that we all must decide on, on the evidence that we have this question, but now we take a little break to collect the questions oh, and good. then we continue. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for these questions. We've got until midnight to answer them. <laughs> And many of these would deserve a lecture. They're very interesting questions, and I, uh, I have enjoyed reading them. So let me take one here. Does Professor Lennox think, well, I hope he does. Um, <laughs> does Professor Lennox think that Lawrence Krauss's book, Universe from Nothing, has buried God? I think that Professor Lawrence Krauss's book has buried atheism. Um, Lawrence Krauss is a physicist. I've debated him. He has got a problem because the current views on space-time are that the universe is finite in time looking backwards, and that even allowing for multiverse theories. And therefore the universe came to be from nothing. But that uh, produces a vast problem. If you are not a theist, my position is that the universe never came from nothing. It came from God, who is spirit and eternal. But if you reject God, you now have a massive problem. How do you get a universe from nothing? Now, nothing for most of us means absence of anything. So getting a universe from nothing, as you read Krauss, the way he copes with it is to redefine nothing. And I go around the world these days giving many lectures on the topic of nothing. Much ado about nothing, as Shakespeare might have put it. It's a very curious thing to me, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to Lawrence Krauss. I quote verbatim. Because something is physical, nothing must be physical. 
especially if it's defined as the absence of something. But if a child wrote that, I'd be worried about their intelligence. <laughs> and in fact, the book at its beginning, it's a very interesting survey of, of, of physics uh, throughout it. I've met and debated Lauren Krauss, but philosophically it's utterly trivial. And he has not solved the problem of getting a universe from nothing. Stephen Hawking was the first to try to solve it. And my answer to Hawking's book is a bit longer, but so I'll do a bit of shameless advertising. I've written a book called God and Stephen Hawking, dealing with this precise question. So I'll say, no, I'll say nothing more about it. <laughs> okay, I have several questions, some of which I have not even looked through yet, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, one topic that, that came up already in our, in our talks and, and has been addressed by a couple of questions is that, that uh, how is it possible that, that evolutionary mechanisms could have produced intelligent minds like ours? How can we trust our minds? Well, to put it shortly, uh, uh, if our representations of reality would not uh, correspond to the reality uh, enough, we wouldn't be here. The fact that we are here and we have the evolutionary history that we have proves that, that, that there is at least enough correspondence between our, our uh, representations and the reality. So. Uh, uh, blind mechanisms of evolution can uh, bring about uh, uh, true beliefs about the universe, about the, our physical surroundings. Those of our ancestors who had false beliefs, who for example thought that it's a good idea to fist fight with huge tigers, those would have not remained uh, and, 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 and and produce procreation. Or those who thought that it's a good idea to jump off the cliff, who had those kinds of false beliefs, or funny beliefs. They would not have been there then to pass on their, their uh, beliefs. So that evolution is, uh, is a, a mechanism that, that also creates true beliefs. That, that there's, there's nothing mysterious about it. It's a, it's a trial and error, so that uh, false beliefs uh, lead to, to catastrophic uh, uh, end results. So then there's, there's more. Well, there's but, a lot more. But you get one, one at a time. So. One at a time. Okay. 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 okay, now here's one. If faith and science are so compatible, why is it that the situation has changed so drastically from virtually all scientists being theists to most being atheists? Surely this tells something to Lennox. Well, what it tells Lennox is that a whole lot of things. In fact, when the survey of scientists who believe in God was most recently done professionally, it was done in um, 80 years, 1996, 1916 was the first LUBA survey. And one of the questions to a thousand scientists was, do you believe in a personal God that answers prayer? And 40% said yes. When that was repeated in 1996, the percentage that said yes was 38.8. It had shifted so little that there was a huge article in Nature on it. It was then done at the level of the Academy of Sciences, but there were no figures from the earlier time. Now, of course, it has shifted, as the, as the questioner suggests, um, but there are reasons for that. I would like to suggest one of the reasons is that almost arbitrarily in my country, atheism and naturalism are regarded as the default position. So no serious public debate is held on the topic. And often when Christians are invited or those of other faiths are invited to debate scientists, the choice is made of some idiot who doesn't really understand science against a very high-powered atheist scientist. And I would love to see a lot more public debate. Um, I go around many schools and I, I feel that 
the nation, my nation, has been much more exposed to the arguments of Richard Dawkins than it has been to arguments that uh, many of us would like to see in the public space, but you cannot get them into the media or the public space because the media do not want a fair discussion. Now, related to this question is, um, why do we need evidence anyway? Faith is to believe in what you do and do not see. Well, that's a very interesting question. That is the atheist conception of faith, or the Dawkins conception, that faith is a religious word that means believing where there's no evidence. That's not Christian faith, ladies and gentlemen. I can only speak as a Christian. Other faiths must speak for themselves. The Christian faith is very much rooted in evidence. And in fact, um, the fourth gospel says it most clearly. Many other things Jesus did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In other words, here's the evidence upon which faith is based. Now, I'm interested that the questioner puts in, uh, faith is what we believe and not what we see. And I noticed that A.C. Grayling, one of our leading philosophers, plus Dawkins, plus a number of others, have fastened on the story of doubting Thomas in the New Testament and say, there you are, Jesus expects you to believe without evidence. My response to that is, can they not read? Because what Jesus said to Thomas, you remember Thomas who demanded evidence for the resurrection and wanted to touch Jesus' wounds and so on, and then confessed that Jesus was God, and Jesus said, because you have seen, you've believed. Blessed, rather, are those who have not seen and have believed. And there says philosopher Grayling, Jesus said, blessed are those who have had no evidence and therefore believed. I say, can he not read? Jesus said, blessed are those that haven't seen. Seeing is only part of evidence. You've never seen gravity. Do you believe in it? Do you think there's any evidence for it? You've never seen an atom. Do you believe in it? This is sheer nonsense that seeing is only one part of the evidence. And what Christ is doing is encouraging those of us who lived long after his time. I've never seen Jesus like the apostles did, but I believe there's loads of evidence on which to base faith in him. So of course we need evidence. Any commitment to anything big requires evidence in every branch of life. And it's no insult to God. God has encouraged us to think he's given us evidence so that we can have certainty. Okay. It's Matti's turn. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I have a couple of interesting questions here. Uh, this says that um, for the sake of the argument, if creator God did exist, how would the, world, the universe be different? What, how would it, where, where would it be seen? And... Uh, I think that uh, if such a benevolent, omnipotent, omniscient entity would exist, at least we would be better designed. No lower back pain, for example. <laughs> and, uh, and other things that, that come uh, along aging. You know that we are, we are not that perfect at all in terms of biological design. We have many, many features with us which, uh, which are kind of uh, nasty as you get older. And, um, and so, so if, if, if there would be such an entity, then, then we would be healthier and, and, and much, much better designed. And then uh, a related question uh, was a short one. Uh, what is the meaning of life? Uh, asked from me. Uh, okay. <laughs> the question was short and answer, <laughs> are you prepared to stay here for how long? Well, the answer shortly is... Uh, uh, Enjoy life and help live. That's, uh, that's the answer, very shortly. Enjoy life and help live. We should enjoy, within our possibilities, the life that we have and help others live too. And that, that's pretty much the same as the golden rule in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in many, many uh, uh, cultures, and in, which is not actually particular to any religions, but this is a kind of a constituent of, of, of cultures as such. I don't think that, that religions uh, should be given the, the, the kind of a, a copyright to ethics or good things or, or, or spirituality or, or meaningfulness. I think that spirituality can be accounted for, for example, like 
like Stuart Kaufman does in his book, uh, Reinventing the Sacred. That, that, that when we can relate ourselves to, the, ourselves to the complex cosmos and see our, our, our place there in terms of, of forces of nature and, 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 and uh, a, a natural selection. I think that gives us a, the, the uh, feeling for, for, uh, of, of belongingness and, 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 and feeling of, of being. And then finally, finally uh, uh, one very interesting question for Mr. Kampin, and that's me, that's as much as I know at least, is that uh, why doesn't pragmatic justification apply to religious theories or, or religious belief systems? Because they explain a lot, they work, they justify. And, uh, and uh, I, I mentioned pragmatic justification in, 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 a, in a case of, of, of technology. So that technology kind of a pragmatic, gives pragmatic justification for, for scientific outlook on which it, de it depends. Well, the difference between a uh, religious belief system and technology is that technology is something that we usually agree upon. And, and, uh, and, and that's why it is good to test our kind of a intuition about pragmatic justification and, and the validity, of, validity of, of assumptions in the light of, of technology. If you take a Muslim or, or Buddhist or, or, or a Mormon or, or a left-wing radical from any part of the world, usually the one thing that they can agree on is about this. So that these work and, and, and bring about all kinds of things. But it is true that, that, um, it is true that, um, that uh, uh, for, for religious persons, and, and that's an empirical fact, that for religious persons, uh, uh, the religious belief system brings all, all kinds of pragmatic utilities. So in, in terms of, in terms of uh, getting grip of life and, and, and explaining events and planning his or her, her life, life uh, ahead. And, and there's lots of uh, empirical uh, study on that. Okay. Well, no, just uh, touching on <laughs> the question of meaning of life is to enjoy life. I want to attack the questions that are asked by people who think of those who do not enjoy life. There are three questions here, all related. Sir Lennox, why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? Two, do we really fit here so perfectly? Natural disasters say otherwise. Some design, some creator. Even if there is a God, why the Christian God? And why did you become a Christian? So these are the hard questions, as I mentioned before. So let me just say something very brief about it. I have written in some detail on it in the book that's just been translated into Finnish. So I'll just concentrate on the heart of this. I understand people, and many of my friends say, OK, there may be evidence of an intelligence in the universe, but please don't talk to me about a personal God. Look at the suffering. Look at the natural disasters, and I myself arrived in New Zealand two days after the earthquake in Christchurch and had to meet people that had lost their relatives. And incidentally, if you want in detail what I said in that context on radio and television, just Google my name in New Zealand. There are lots of stuff in there, but the heart of it is this, and it's one of the reasons I'm a Christian, ladies and gentlemen, which I was asked here. Somebody said, is that too personal a question? Well, it is a personal question. So if you don't want to hear the answer, just go to sleep for a couple of minutes. <laughs> but it's all revolved together because I find this the hardest issue. I've been in Auschwitz many times, and I've wept every time. I've seen the effects of an earthquake and so on. And when you begin to reflect on these things, it becomes very difficult. Because if you read uh, studies on plate tectonics, you'll discover that plate tectonics are essential for life. And here's a supreme irony. We've got a, a world which has got plates that float, and sometimes they rub and create earthquakes. And that is necessary for life. We wouldn't be alive without that. And yet, if you build a house above a fault line, you can have an earthquake. Now. The philosophers have argued for centuries, and I bet we've done it, especially us students. Well, I'm not one anymore, I suppose. Um, 
a good, all-powerful God could, should, might, and we argue and argue and argue and argue, and are we satisfied with the result? No. I've never met anybody satisfied with the results of that kind of argumentation. And when I discovered that, in order to remove the blockage, I ask a different question, and it's this. Granted that the world is like that, there's some good and there's a lot of evil. I pictured like Coventry Cathedral, which as many of you will know was bombed during the war. You go into it, you see immediately a bomb has hit it. But then you begin to see traces of a former beauty. So you get a mixed picture. And our world presents a mixed picture. There's the beauty of the lake on which he has his summer cottage, and I'd love to go there. There's the ugliness of barbed wire, mines, bombs, disease, and everything else. And the big question I face as a person who believes in God is, how do I cope with it? So the question I ask myself, to cut it short, is this. Granted that we can't solve the philosophical question, is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that there, there is a God who can be trusted with an answer to it? And my argument is very simple, ladies and gentlemen. You know that at the heart of Christianity is a cross. The Christian claim is that Jesus was God incarnate. Now, you might find that very difficult, but in order to understand and reject Christianity, you need to listen to what it says. And what it claims is that that was God on that cross in some sense. What's God doing on a cross? Well, I'll tell you what it tells me at least. It tells me that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. And if that were the end of the story, I wouldn't be here. But it's not the end of the story. Because the Christian claim is that Jesus rose from the dead, and therefore death is not the end. And therefore, when you think of the deepest human problem of all, the cry for justice, and here's my massive problem with atheism, because atheism does not ultimately grant ultimate justice. We can fight for justice in this life, as Richard Dawkins pointed out to me, and I said, Richard, that's wonderful, and I do it too. But because you believe death is the end, you have no ultimate hope of justice, so that in the end, the vast majority of human beings who've ever lived will never get justice. They don't get it in this life, and there's no afterlife to get it in. But because I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I believe there will be a final judgment, ladies and gentlemen. And that's a wonderful thing, because it means that the terrorists will not in the end get away with it. Now, that's my short answer. I'm glad this book has come out and finished, because it's one of the topics that I deal with, because I meet so many colleagues that find it massively difficult. And here, ladies and gentlemen, Christianity does not compete with any other religion. Because so far as I can see, what Jesus offers through his death and resurrection is utterly unique. So he's not in competition. So that would be my answer to that. And simultaneously, my answer to why I am a Christian. Because there I find something I find nowhere else. And that is my personal answer to the question. And you can wake up again if you're not interested in such answers. Okay, thank you. One last question, Matti. Yeah, just... Uh, uh... Uh, continue uh, from what, what John Lennox just, just said. I, I'm, I'm glad that this uh, question of justice came up here because uh, the, the view of, of, of Christianity that we just heard, it is something that, that, uh, that uh, has a strong impact on, for example, on, on, on children. I have many times thought that about that as a, as a father when explaining to my children why bad things happen, how to cope with them. And I Many times I've thought that it would be so simple if I could just say that that that, that it doesn't matter. It will be it will be leveled then in the afterlife. It would matter. Yeah. Matters. I mean that that it would be leveled or, or, or the, the equal to then 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 later on. But I I just don't have I I cannot do that. I I think that it would be it would be awfully uh, wrong of me and 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 I would. Uh, I would offer a, a too easy a solution. Uh, you, you probably have noticed that why why the, uh, the the stories of Christianity they are they are kind of easy to understand, and also the character of the of the Creator God they are easy to understand. Uh, they are stories that even a child can 
they are stories <laughs> that even a child can understand. And uh, I think that's, that, 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 would, that should be uh, understood as a, as, a, as a warning sign. That could be understood as evidence that they're true, of course. No. I would expect be, God no. to reveal himself in a way that everybody could understand. The, 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 the because that answer is simple, if I yeah. might just point out, doesn't mean it's false. Yeah. yeah, but there's no way to permit that wall of argument, that all that wall of uh, different understandings. That's 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 at least in this question. Is, is, oh, but is, there is, there is. You see, uh, the very last question I was asked here is, what's the evidence for the resurrection? That's the way to get through the wall is to look at the actual evidence, both historical and personal, for the resurrection of Jesus. But we don't have any time to do that today. That's another topic. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. But before we end this uh, discussion, I'd like to recommend the extra session in May, because there will be a very interesting guest from America, Trent Doherty, who is a philosopher and very good epistemologist, and I think a theist too. And he... He, 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 he has, he's just publishing a collection of essays on the problem of evil called uh, Skeptical Theism. And if any, anybody, so, so welcome to that stuff. Well, next, next extra session in May. But now let's uh, thank the speakers and the audience and we will end this.